Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Controlling Terpenes and Cannabinoids in Flower and Extract, presented by Dr. Marcus Rogan, founder and CEO of Complex Biotech Discovery Ventures. My name is Xavier Gutierrez, and I will be your moderator for today's event. We're delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by LabRoots. LabRoots is the leading scientific social networking website and producer of educational virtual events and webinars. Now, before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want during the presentation. Simply click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen and type your questions into the drop-down box. Our speaker will respond to your questions via email following the presentation. And if you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, please click on the Ask a Question box to let us know that you're experiencing a problem. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the continuing education credits tab located in the top right corner of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. Now, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Rogan. I will now turn the presentation over to him. Thank you, Savia. Uh, welcome to my presentation today, uh, as already uh, mentioned, I will talk about our research in controlling terpenes and cannabinoids in flower and extract. Uh, because I think this is a often overlooked aspect of cannabis production. Everyone talks about the strains and that um, certain strains help, others don't. And uh, it seems to be a fixed idea that if you have a sour diesel, that's it, and then nothing else will change, and it will always be the same. Uh, but that is not the case. And uh, so I want to present our research of uh, where those changes happen and how one could influence those. Uh, but first, let's uh, just talk about the, the basics uh, of what we are actually going to talk about in this presentation. Uh, we talk about drying and curing. We talk about extraction and post-processing. Because in all those steps, changes to the molecular makeup can happen. Uh, and to make it easier for everyone to follow what those changes are, uh, I devised uh, hopefully easy to understand uh, data visualization uh, that shows both the concentration and the ratio of different uh, cannabinoids and terpenes. Here in this slide, we see that the central circle uh, shows in diameter the cannabinoid concentration, and then in the angles uh, or the the pies, uh, the pieces of the pie, um, the amount or the relative amount of THC, THC acid, CBD, and CBD acid, uh, and th those are given in different uh, colors. Uh, the same holds for terpenes, which are shown by the outer ring. Again, the diameter of the ring will indicate how much total terpenes are in the flower or extract and the different colored parts of the ring uh, indicate if they are limonene, beta carophyllene, pine, pinene, and so on. It is not so important to remember which color correlates to which cannabinoid or terpene. It is more important to just understand the basics of how this was set up, uh, and then you can compare one set of rings to another set to easily understand what might be going on in the process. So as an example, here I showed some uh, strains that we were growing in the uh, Southern California uh, dispensary or collective that I was working in prior. Uh, we have here Gorilla Glue, a cookie strain, a sour diesel, lemonade haze. And you already can tell that those different strains, or better mentioned or uh, called uh, cultivars, show um, by their different ring size for the terpenes that some might have more terpenes or are more flavorful uh, than others. The cannabinoid ratios um, are all THC, right? Or THC acid in the case as a flower, but we only grew THC strains, no CBD strains uh, in the mix. Uh, but they had slight variations in how much uh, potency they had. Uh, again, I had to play with this visualization that obviously there are not more terpenes in the flower than there are cannabinoids, uh, but uh, as the terpene 
disk is a bit more complicated. I needed more space or, to show it better. Uh, and by just looking at the color makeup of the outer ring, you can see that there are different uh, terpene profiles, and that might indicate different flavors. Sour diesel and lemonade haze on the right um, are mostly dominated by this gray aspect, which actually is myrcene, while the cookie and sour diesels mainly are blue. And uh, even myself already forgot which terpene that stands for. So, uh, but it's not just that simple to look at colors. Uh, we should remind ourselves that uh, the cannabis flower not offers only THC, CBD, and terpene, uh, but there are so many more cannabinoids uh, that are of interest or should be of interest, and uh, there have been already 144 or more identified. And uh, then there are over 200 terpenes that are already identified in the cannabis plant. Uh, we currently track about 50, depending on the testing laboratory. And for cannabinoids, we generally only track 10, uh, and state regulations often require less. Uh, but we're still not done yet. Uh, the cannabis flower also offers flavonoids uh, that are con considerably under research right now because no one tests for them. If you can't see them, you can't really work on uh, furthering that aspect of understanding. But there's still other uh, molecules that might have a biological effect on the patient uh, or the consumer. Uh, so I hope that uh, with the advancing science and the more money that is poured into the industry at some point, we actually are able to research those. But let's now come to the focus of this talk uh, when we talk about how we can uh, track and hopefully affect the changes that are happening in the cannabis plant. So at first, there's the drying process. Uh, everyone understands that the cannabis flower after harvest has to be dried to preserve. Uh, but it, it was difficult for me at first to understand what is done in drying or why it is done this way. So we, we undertook some studies to figure out how the drying process works or how we could control it. Uh, so here in this example, you already see that we, if we do a slower dry, we have more terpenes left over. And uh, here, um, this is what we actually do in drying we try to bring the uh, water content in the flower to a low enough level so that no water is available, water activity, uh, for mold and bacteria to grow on it. And uh, this number is normally considered to be uh, 0.65 of water activity. And uh, as you see, the days progress along the x-axis. Uh, at the harvest, the plant is wet, so water activity is nearly one. Uh, but over time, this draw, goes down and then dips below 0.65. So now we know how we can measure it and what target we have. So we can now play with different conditions to change uh, the, the gradient of, dry, uh, of basically water activity over days. And we found that when we played with the drying conditions to come to a slower dry, to basically dry our plant over a two-week period instead of a one-week period, we were able to produce a dried cannabis flower with a higher terpene level uh, compared to the faster grow. Uh, as this is a slower grow, we had to be mindful of not uh, allowing for mold growth. Uh, but we kept that under control as well. So in the table on the right, uh, you see that the terpene levels are higher in two uh, strains that we tested in these two different drying conditions. And after drying comes the cure. Uh, the cure was always a very weird thing for me. Uh, I thought it weird to put a cannabis flower in a bucket or a glass jar and then just wait. Uh, I'm still trying to learn more of what actually is happening. Uh, but my first study was to see how can I, the, the dry curing is also just storage. So how can I store cannabis over a long time uh, and preserve it so that we don't have the couch lock, we don't have the CBN after a year of storage. So I was uh, researching with a partner 
uh, partner company to see if different atmospheres, packaging atmospheres, would influence the terpene and cannabinoid concentrations in the flower. And uh, we did. We tried va vacuum packaging, uh, uh, nitrogen packaging, uh, CO2 packaging, and argon. Uh, those atmospheres or modified atmospheres might be not, uh, of. Um, you might remember those when you pack uh, when you have other food goods that you buy in a store because they're often packaged under nitrogen uh, and sometimes CO2, particularly if you buy sparkling water. So uh, we do have graphs associated with it, and uh, we do see a, in the cannabinoid in general decrease uh, in potency. Uh, we also did check for decarboxylation and CBN growth and there were, or CBN development. There was not much CBN developed in the time frame that I did do the study. Uh, and for the terpenes, uh, these are just total terpene levels. Uh, we did we do see a little dip, but then they grow back up. Um, and while initially this looks weird, um, I have seen this in multiple experiments on multiple uh, repeats. It appears that the cannabis flower is still somewhat alive, uh, that some kind of terpenes are still produced. And uh, if we would have a half an hour talk about just terpenes in storage, uh, we could go into finer detail uh, that the ratio of different cannabinoids, uh, of different terpenes, sorry, uh, changes. And let me just jump back a slide. Uh, because if you look at the uh, terpene rings of the different atmosphere packaging, uh, vacuum, nitrogen, CO2, and uh, air, um, or actually not air, it's argon, uh, when you look at the colors, you see that the relationship or the order of colors does change. The blue and the yellow is always the most dominant, second most dominant. But the colors just after that, so at the uh, 9 o'clock, 7 o'clock, um, up to 11 o'clock um, part of the ring, uh, the order of the coloring and therefore the terpenes changes. So we do not only see a change in overall terpene production or terpene uh, presence, but also in the relative ratios of those terpenes. So we uh, seem to have a handle on uh, changing the, the flavor of the cannabis cultivar. Okay, so uh, moving on from there, we've, we've now talked about how to dry uh, of, and how to uh, cure or store our cannabis and that we can uh, influence uh, the cannabinoids and terpenes in that step. But uh, let's now talk about extraction. And even before we get into extraction, uh, we have to consider how do we feed our cannabis flower into a, an extraction vessel. Uh, we properly want a powder because the powder might uh, offer us a better packing density, uh, better flow behavior of the solvent, and so on and so forth. Uh, but uh, I wanted to know, does that actually change the outcome? And surprisingly, it does. Uh, depending on how we mill or not mill our cannabis flour for the extraction process, we actually change the outcome or the, the oil we collect from it. Uh, but first, we had to check, do we destroy the cannabinoids? Did we destroy the THC? That was a question that I heard from a, a, co a former colleague of mine uh, quite a few years ago. Um, and I found it was a weird question because a mill that can destroy THC would be awesome and I get an old price for it. Uh, but this, after thinking about it a little, the question does hold true. Does, the, does the, the grinding with a maybe heating aspect or um, the higher surface area, does it lead to a change in my molecular makeup? So here on the left, we're looking at a graph that shows the decarboxylation um, ratio of THC to THC acid in the flower before milling, non-ground, which is the column all the way to the left, uh, and then ground and different conditions, the food blender at a 
0.5 millimeter sieve uh, all the way to a 10 millimeter particle size. And uh, how this uh, mill looked uh, that we used to get the precise particle sizes between 0.5 and 10 millimeters uh, is shown in the picture up on the right. Uh, it's a fridge mill where we can change the particle size depending on just putting different sieves in. And the residence time in the mill is short enough to not heat the flour. So there is, is a apparent slight difference uh, in the decarboxylation, but it all falls within measuring errors and uh, can be uh, considered as not important. And then also on the terpene side, we did not see a change in terpene uh, levels in the flour after milling. Uh, but we do have to say that is just after directly after milling. If we would try to store milled cannabis over a longer period of time, let's say a week, uh, we would lose most of the terpenes. The, part, uh, the surface area is large enough that just everything evaporates. So mill and extract directly. Do not try to store milled cannabis. It's, uh, that's a really bad idea. So now the effect of mill particles on the extraction itself. So on the left, again, we see the cannabinoids, uh, the yellow bars, uh, and we are looking at recovery of THC. So I, I calculate how much THC is in my starting material and how much THC uh, is by weight, uh, by mass in my product. And uh, we, we are hanging around 30% uh, recovery, which would be a pretty bad extraction if you want to do that commercially. Uh, but for various reasons of chem chem chemistry, uh, I had to go with initial rates. These are initial rates experiments. So everyone who had a chemistry class might remember those. I could not take it to completion because then I wouldn't see a difference. If everything completes, I don't see a difference. So I stayed at initial rate. Um, surprisingly, uh, Non-ground cannabis flour actually gave us uh, quite a decent level of recovery. One food blender ground cannabis uh, was not very well received in recovery, and the two millimeter or the smallest particle size tested in the experiments uh, was the best here. And also for the terpene recovery, we saw the highest numbers, the highest number of recovery uh, in the two uh, millimeter particle size. And the, the reason why non-ground uh, cannabis has a high THC recovery is a little longer story, but it's, um, it hopefully becomes apparent uh, in the next few slides. Okay. So what I also should not forget is packing density does affect uh, how the extraction goes. Uh, I tried my hand on a visualization to show this. Uh, what we are seeing here is uh, a, a diagram of a column, of an extractor column. Um, if you think of a long pipe, that is how it would look from the top. The flow of our supercritical CO2 is from top to bottom. And uh, the, the green color, which would be a whole square, is the percentage of THC in the flower in the position uh, along that column. So we had 9% THC in the flour throughout the column. And then if you extract it in a loose packed state, which would be the blue show, uh, triangle nearly, uh, you would see that at the top of the column, every, everything of the THC has been extracted. But in the middle of the column, you still have about 3% left. And at the bottom of the column, the flour still has 3.5% THC in it. Uh, but it's a relatively good extraction, and we, we removed it most of it throughout the column. But if a full-packed or a half-packed column where we just put in a bit of cannabis, tempered it down, packed it really tight, put a bit more in, um, you do see a change in the cannabis extract or the THC extracted and the bottom part of the column where more THC stayed behind, and therefore it was a less effective extraction. Um, we started these experiments because we were looking at channeling, and we did not see channeling, but we saw this change in where the THC happen, happens to reside. And it appears that the THC is extracted preferentially at the beginning of the flow, uh, so at the top, 
uh, and uh, the, t uh, the CO2 that comes to the lower part of the column at that point already is saturated in THC and can't take up any more. So one would have to wait until the top is extracted before the bottom can continue, uh, can actually be extracted. Uh, and a few more aspects to it. Uh, and please consider this is an experiment that worked, uh, that is particular for my, uh, this one instrument I worked on. A slightly different machine might behave somewhat different, but it's still interesting to keep in mind that one should test it uh, because one or two of those tests can save you a lot of money over the long run. Yeah. So how did we actually do the experiments? So here we, we did the experiment on an apex supercritical CO2 extractor, uh, and the conditions are given in the on the left side. Uh, we used uh, three kilograms of uh, plant matter. So for the American audience, that's about six and a little pounds of cannabis flower per run, and then we did two fractions, uh, first a terpene fraction and then a cannabinoid fraction, and the times were chosen to do initial rates. So none of this was extracted to completion. And uh, on our first fraction, we had a, ter a terpene fraction, and we want a high level of uh, terpenes, a high concentration, uh, and that is shown on the left side of the graph. The, uh, the left graph that shows that the concentration of fraction one in terpenes is very high for the food blender, the two millimeters and the 10 millimeters. So that's a very good terpene fraction as the picture shows on the right. The graph on the right shows the terpene concentration in F2, so where we want the cannabinoids to be. So there we want a low number for the concentration of terpenes. So two millimeters seem to, appears to win. And then uh, looking at uh, the cannabinoids, again, in fraction one, we want no cannabinoids, and uh, most milled cannabis uh, was very effective in that, and the non-ground cannabis was very bad. Uh, quite a high amount of THC was already extracted. And then uh, we want a high concentration of cannabinoids in the second fraction, and here two millimeters and six millimeters appears to be the winner. So overall, we can say that and uh, the two millimeter or the smallest particle size tested uh, gives us the best yields, the best recoveries, but also the best precision in our uh, cannabis production. And uh, the high concentration of cannabinoids in fraction one for the non-ground is the reason why overall the non-ground had a quite high recovery because it, it started extracting cannabinoids before it was done with the terpenes. Uh, which it shouldn't have been uh, been doing. Okay. So uh, when we now look at the extraction condition itself, so past the milling, now actually how we do we change the CO2 conditions uh, to extract different uh, aspects of the flower? Uh, we can actually separate terpenes from uh, cannabinoids, as I already showed in the last few gra uh, graphs for the milling study. But not only that, if we would have a strain that uh, is 50-50 or one-to-one -one in cannabinoid, uh, in THC to CBD, we might actually be able to split uh, those two into two different fractions where we can enrich one in THC and the other one in CBD. Um, and this is all based on some uh, data from work I had produced in optimizing the CO2 extractor. Uh, the first graph you see here is this response surface of the space of different temperatures and pressures of how it affects the uh, THC recovery in the supercritical space. So I locked or mapped uh, all possibilities of changing temperatures and pressures and how that affects my extraction yield. And I also did this in the subcritical space where the graph looks slightly different, but all of them point in highest pressure and highest temperature being the best for extraction. Uh, and uh, when you think about how CO2 works in a liquid or a supercritical state, uh, high pressure and high temperature combined means a higher density. So having a, a thicker solvent, so to say, gives us better extraction abilities because THC is pretty bad uh, in dissolving in CO2. So a denser solvent uh, dissolves more THC. 
So in our terpene fraction, that was uh, the green experiments early on in the milling, uh, we looked at the terpene fraction or percentage of terpenes, not of the total recovery because uh, we can go to about 100% recovery in all of those experiments anyway, but we wanted a precise, uh, clean terpene fraction, uh, as you can see in the picture on the left. So this is the response surface for the supercritical space, and here we have it for the subcritical space. Both of them seem to point at the, sub, uh, the supercritical point, so at the lowest pressure with the right temperature. Right? One is the low temperature in the supercritical, and in the subcritical, it's the higher temperature, which then is pointing at the uh, supercritical point. Yeah. But now that we have all these uh, response surfaces, we can actually uh, learn some more in-depth aspects uh, of cannabis extraction in CO2. And here I compare the supercritical to the subcritical because I've heard a lot that subcritical is the best or supercritical is the best and uh, that might all be nice and true for whoever believes in this. Uh, I don't really hold beliefs. I try to, uh, to validate it or base it on uh, data. Uh, so therefore I could use my experiments to compare. And when I look at uh, THC recovery at a set time, I can recover more THC in the supercritical space. As all the graphs already were indicating, the higher density gives us a better solubility and therefore faster recovery or faster extraction. Uh, supercritical CO2 is more dense than liquid CO2, so there we go. We get better recoveries. Uh, in the terpene fractions, we actually extract a little bit more terpene, 63% uh, in the supercritical space compared to 52%. No, sorry, I misspoke. The terpene fraction, meaning the percentage of the makeup of the liquid that is terpene is 63% in supercritical, so more than half, two-thirds two -thirds of the liquid are ter terpenes, while only a half of it is terpenes in the subcritical space. So it's a, it's a nicer, purer uh, terpene fraction in the supercritical space uh, at higher yields, at 82% uh, while compared to 34% yield uh, in the subcritical space. So I, I, for my processes and what I want, the supercritical seems to be far better than the subcritical. Uh, other things we learn, THC extracts faster than THC acid. So meaning the neutral cannabinoids are more soluble in CO2 than the uh, acid cannabinoids. Here we see that the starting material has about 8% decarboxylation uh, in one experiment or 14% in the other experiment. And after seven hours, we do have an enriched decarboxylation ratio of 25%. So more THC than uh, compared to THC acid than uh, in the starting material. But when we run this experiment to completion at 22 hours, we are back to what we started. So we didn't decarboxylate in the reaction, but we did um, in, uh, extract THC first and THC acid second. That's why those numbers change. Uh, and uh, therefore, you can play with your THC to THC A ratio. And you don't have to go fully activated or feel fully decarboxylated or non decarboxylate not decarboxylated at all, you can actually set it somewhere in the middle if you so choose or need it. Uh, and then also CBD is more uh, soluble in CO2 than THC is. And here, unfortunately, we did not really have a one-to-one -one strain, so my numbers are really, really small. But what you can see here is that we, we start with a, a very low uh, CBD ratio compared to THC, which increases after seven hours, but then goes back to the starting number uh, at completion of the experiment, uh, indicating that CBD again extracted first before THC came off. And uh, again, this means we can change the THC to CBD ratio uh, if that is of interest. So if anyone has a problem with hemp having too much THC in it and you need to preserve uh, uh, suppress the THC amount. Uh, you might not have to use a column chromatography afterwards. You might be able to solve that aspect already in your extraction aspect. And uh, if you have any further questions, at the end, there's my email. Uh, and I'm happy to help you with any uh, questions that arise. And a bonus point, uh, 
CBD acid decarboxylates slower than THC acid. Uh, for you, that might be important that if you were used to decarboxylating your THC acid extract on the hot plate after extraction and you now got into the hemp business, uh, those numbers are off and you have to change them. Why that is the case, um, I recently figured out with some help from the University of British Columbia and Vancouver, we did some computation chemistry experiments and I will present those results uh, soon. Uh, and we hope to have the publication out in the next few months. Uh, so if you're really into geeky science, we are happy to help you with that as well. So, um, and then going through the data, we can actually enrich not only CBD, uh, but other cannabinoids might also have a different solubility behavior, and therefore we can change uh, the uh, CBG ratio in our extract depending on our conditions. So what if we want to take it really far now, can we change the terpene ratios? Uh, and it is possible. So if you consider that sativas are rich in monoterpenes and indicas are rich in sesquiterpenes based on a study by Hasekamp on the uh, Dutch cannabis market, uh, I was looking, can I change the mono to sesquiterpenes with the CO2 extractor? And yes, we can. Uh, it's a small effect, but nevertheless, we can use it. We could use it to buffer any variants that come out of a grow. And uh, I remember the first time I did an extraction, my boss told me it doesn't look right. And as an organic chemist, I was always wondering, I never think about how something looks. Like I think the most I ever produced in my PhD thesis was 10 milligrams of my material. So I've never, ever looked at how how my molecules appear or present themselves. Uh, if you read scientific papers, there's always an, <laughs> an oil, an off yellow oil or a transparent oil. So basically no one really seen it and no one really cares. But in the cannabis industry you do. So yes, uh, here's my visual guide to cannabinoids or cannabis extracts. Uh, this is what you maybe are used to, how your extract looks when it comes out of the CO2 extractor. I call this diarrhea. Uh, but you can also, when you play with your extraction process, you can get these very nice, solid THCA-rich extracts out. Uh, they are really fun to play with, and you can do some cool things like supercharge your pre-roll to 40% plus THC, uh, or you can use it to uh, treat a, a young kid with epilepsy that shouldn't get high. Um, I'm happy to... Uh, to point you in the right direction, depending on your needs. And also, if you want a vape cartridge, um, maybe you want your oil looking like this when it comes out of the extractor. Uh, so depending on how you set your CO2 extractor, you can produce different extracts. And this visual guide should already bring home the point I want to make throughout the whole presentation, that the cannabinoid and terpene ratio uh, or makeup is not static. Uh, it's not just depending on which strain you use. It's de it also is highly dependent on what you do in your extraction or, or the rest of all the processing aspects. So um, another processing aspect is decarboxylation. Decarboxylation or activation, as it is like, uh, preferred to re uh, be referred to in the cannabis industry, um, it appears that often cannabis extracts are they are extracted and then they're put on a hot plate and they're just boiled and cooked or put in an oven and you just wait until they stop bubbling and then you're done with your uh, decarboxylation. Uh, but while you do this, you actually expose your extract to air. And uh, as your metal handrail in your... Uh, office might tell you that oxygen and heat might not be a great idea because it rusts. The same happens to cannabinoids. They don't rust, but they do degrade. And uh, that's what I wanted to show with the visualization here. When you do decarboxylation under air, you not only have your THC, but uh, you also have other things like CBN. You might get delta-8, THC, and a host of other molecules that I'm still busy trying to identify right now. So 
to be able to control, you have to understand what is happening. And uh, the current method is you put it on a hot plate, you at some point take a, take a sample, you ship it off to a lab, or you put it in your HPLC, and uh, if you shipped it off a week later, you have a result, or if you have your own HPLC, 20, 30 minutes later, you have a result. But that is not in any time frame that is useful if you do a decarboxylation that only takes an hour on your hot plate. So I developed an IR monitoring system where we can basically in real time track the decarboxylation. So here on the left, we see overlaid IR spectra of uh, our cannabis extract while it goes through the decarboxylation step. Uh, and we one would have to zoom in and uh, it still wouldn't be helpful because IR doesn't correspond to molecules on peaks, but it stretches. So you have to use uh, higher math to understand what actually is THCA, what is THC. But with that, we could train the machine to show it this THC, this THC acid, tell me when all the THC acid is gone, and then I stop my decarboxylation. And having that understanding allowed us from what normally looks like this really dark tar uh, in the picture on the left or the middle aspect of the screen, um, we are getting the, uh, these uh, decarboxylated oils that are still vibrant orange uh, from the carotenes. Uh, because when carotenes degrade and under oxygen, they turn black, and that's what you see in the middle. So now that we can control uh, the endpoint of decarboxylation uh, more precise with the IR, uh, we can now get better extracts. And uh, to just show to you that this actually works, is here you see our um, on the left graph, you see the THC growing in and the THC acid depleting over time. And we correlate the, the IR measurements with LC measurements. And we have a very good agreement that there is a good agreement. We show on the right in the two graphs that the predicted, uh, decarbox, uh, the pre predicted percentage of THC by, by IR by, uh, compared to the reference THC from the HPLC uh, is in near perfect agreement. So we are very confident that this is a nice method for the production industry to uh, track the decarboxylation. So, and uh, last aspect of uh, post-processing would be the distillation. Uh, I've heard, I've seen that uh, not all the THC actually distills over, but it turns into something else. What is it? I can't yet fully say. I'm ru still running experiments right now, actually this week. Uh, we hope to get a better handle on it. Uh, we're basically doing distillations, and then we're trying to sort through the mess and pick out every molecule and trying to figure out what it is. And it will still take some time, but I hope to figure out what those color aspects in my visualization actually represents. And when I know what it is, maybe we can do something about it and prevent it. So we now spoke about, or I presented to you, that different processing aspects lead to different challenges and different influences on the makeup of the cannabis flower. Uh, so I thought I'd actually bring you an example, a real life example that we came across. Uh, we had a male patient in his mid-30s uh, with severe epileptic seizures throughout the day, and he sought treatment. Uh, so he bought a CBD tincture, uh, CBD THC tincture, three to one. Um, and I'm sorry that the screen already shows the whole slide, so you can get the punchline at the end. I normally like to bring this up slowly. But basically, he took a three to one tincture. It worked for him. Uh, came back for the next fra uh, next bottle, and then it didn't work anymore. And uh, while he was really scared and everyone else was very concerned, I was actually happy uh, from a scientific aspect. Not not from a personal. It was uh, a bad experience for those patients that I, I feel with him. Uh, but it did show what I was expecting to see or was fearful of. And now I had a real life example that we had actually changed from diamond OG to lemon hay, lemonade haze uh, for the THC aspect of our tincture. The uh, tincture was made with isolated CBD, 
and uh, THC coming from a uh, plant extract. We removed all terpenes prior to formulation, and we actually tested the two bottles of Diamond OG and Lemonade Haze, and the CBD and the THC aspects of the formulations were identical, so my colleague was very, very good at mixing it. Uh, the THC acid and CBD acid aspect of the formulation were also nearly identical. CBN, there was much of a difference. CBG, not much of difference. THCV present in both. And then in CBGA and CBC, we do see a slight, we finally see some difference between the two. But as I told you earlier, there are over 140 cannabinoids already identified. So is it those two that are now present in absence that do the job, or is it the ones we don't even test for? Uh, I can't say, but what I can say is we switched him back to Diamond OG and the seizures uh, disappeared again. So we had that solved at least for this one patient. Uh, but it also should lead you to consider that if cannabis helps you for your problem, that doesn't mean it will help everyone or every cannabis will help uh, everyone or even that a different strain will help you with your problem. And then at the aspect of different production processes might change it. So if you buy a Diamond OG from us or from the next, uh, next over manufacturer, uh, even if we started with the same clones, we might end up with completely different molecular makeups in our products. So therefore, uh, this gets very, very complicated very quickly. Uh, and the aspect of which cannabinoids are actually present, uh, I hope that in the next few months, I do have a test laboratory up and running that can offer those analytics. Uh, but let us get to the conclusion and um, the shout outs to everyone who helped me because uh, that's a lot of work and I couldn't do it all by myself. So the colleagues that helped me on the job were Taylor Tra, uh, Blake Grauholz and Alison Justice. So if you see those at events uh, or at uh, company gatherings, please say hi. Uh, on the company side, um, most of the work was done at Outco, that's a dispensary and cannabis producer down in San Diego. Uh, that provided us with the plant material and the space to do the experiments. Then Nate's uh, controls uh, helped us with the drying experiments, the packaging experiments for different atmospheres were done with Henkelman uh, because they're vacuum packaging systems so that I can infuse them back with uh, other gases. Uh, the IR experiments were done with the help of Perkin Alma. They provided us uh, with the instruments and support. The milling experiments were done with and for Fritch. And uh, the extractor was provided uh, from Apex, and uh, we worked closely with them to get the machine working in a way that we like that to be. And then finally, as the introduction said, I am now living in Vancouver, Canada, uh, as cannabis is legal in Canada on a federal level, so I can actually partner up with the local university, the uh, UBC. Uh, to do more research, and that is what my company does. We do custom research in support of the industry. So if you want to know what are your cannabinoids beyond the 10, we can do those tests, hopefully soon. Uh, we also have a smoke machine where you can smoke a vape cartridge, but it doesn't. it's not you that smokes it, but the HPLC. So you can see what comes out of your vape cartridges, what oils work best with the materials to choose. Or uh, we custom design those IR analytic systems uh, to be included in your processes if so needed. Um, I think that's enough tooting of my own horn. Uh, if you want the slides, I think they're provided by the, uh, by the host, LabRoots. Uh, but I also put all my presentations up on SlideShare, and the link is given on the bottom left. Uh, those. Uh, also include all the my past and future presentations so you can flick through some other experimental results. And if you have any questions, uh, the email is given on the bottom right. And with that, uh, I thank you very much for your attention and I hand it back to Sabia. Thank you, Dr. Rogan, for that informative presentation.
I would also like to thank Labridge for making today's educational webcast possible. And before we go, I want to let everyone know that this webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through June of 2019. And as a final reminder, our speaker will follow up with any questions you've submitted via email. And that's all for now. Thank you for joining us, and we hope to see you again soon. Goodbye.